am Dr. Rhonda Jetter, Dean of the College of Education. Thank you for joining us for our Black History program. We must take the time to look back to understand the advances we have made and the barriers that still exist. I want to greet you and let you know we have something coming along the way today that's really exciting. This is an exciting time in history for black Americans. We have had the advantage of having our first black president and the first African American female Supreme Court justice will be named shortly. A Bowie State student has led the way in the MJ show on Broadway and the first black female vice president is in office. Black lives are beginning to matter in ways they never have before. Yet while we are experiencing the best of times, as they say in A Tale of Two Cities, we are also experiencing the worst of times. Though it has been almost 200 years since slavery, black men and women are being shot in the streets and the people who do so go free. HBCUs, even here at Bowie State University, are the object of bomb threats. We still have few owners of professional sports teams, and black people are still struggling to be included at the top echelons of many companies and occupations. But like Maya Angelou says, but still we rise. So today, I want to not only greet you, but also our speaker, Mr. John Franklin, alumni who've tuned in to support us, students across campus, Dr. Sammy Miller, who would like to be the person who's going to introduce our speaker, and faculty, staff, administrators who have joined us here today. I want to leave you with one thought. That is, always think of the College of Education as your home. We have all levels of education here, from the bachelor's degree in teaching or sports management, to a master's degree in teaching, culturally responsive teacher leadership, reading, schools counseling, school psychology, mental health counseling, and counseling psychology, MAT, educational studies, or a doctorate in educational leadership. We encourage you to come back here when you want to pursue your next degree. If you do, we will prepare you for life. Once again, welcome to our special Black History program today. Thank you. Black History Month initially began as Negro History Week in February of 1926. It was established by the works of Dr. Carter G. Woodson, the father of black history. The purpose of this important recognition, as stated by Dr. Woodson, was that we should emphasize not Negro history, but the Negro in history. He also believed that those who have no record of what their forebears have accomplished lose the inspiration which comes from the teachings of biography and history. Dr. Woodson helped establish the field of African American studies and created his organization, the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, which aimed to encourage people of all ethnic and social backgrounds to discuss the black experience. Dr. Woodson chose February as the landing of Negro History Week and the second week of the month in particular to acknowledge the birthdays of two Americans who played prominent roles in the shaping of black history, Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, whose birthdays are February 12th and 14th, respectively. Dr. Woodson's organization was later renamed to the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, and is currently the oldest historical society established for the, prom for the promotion of African American history. In 1976, 50 years after the, the official launch of Negro History Week, the association used its influence to institutionalize the shifts from a week to a month and from Negro history to black history. Thus, the first official observance of Black History Month came in February of that year from President Gerald Ford, whose words established Black History Month and paid homage to Dr. Woodson and the association. It was 10 years later in 1986, which was also the first year of the celebration of Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday as a national holiday, the U.S. Congress in a joint resolution of the House and Senate designated the month of February as National Black History Month, with the purpose of Black History Month serving to make all Americans 
aware of the struggle for freedom and equal opportunity. Dr. Carter G. Woodson worked from his home in Northwest Washington, D.C. He published many journals, bulletins, and wrote several books. One book in particular that you may be familiar with, Dr. Woodson published in 1933, The Miseducation of the Negro. It was a collection of articles and speeches, and this book is still referenced and read today. Good evening, everyone. I'm so pleased tonight to introduce John Whittington Franklin. John Whittington Franklin has specialized in the history and culture of Africa and its diaspora for over the past 50 years. He's lived in Senegal, worked and traveled extensively in Africa. John's career at the Smithsonian began in Dakar, Senegal, while he was teaching English for the Senegalese Ministry of Higher Education. In 2005, John was among the first staff members of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, which opened in 2016. He built partnerships for the museum with universities and museums in the United States, Canada, Brazil, the United Kingdom, France, Africa, and the Caribbean. He most recently has engaged in the Tulsa, Oklahoma, on facets of the commemoration of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre, which his grandfather survived. John Whittington Franklin is the son of the Dean of American Historians, the late great John Hope Franklin. On a personal note, John's been a long-standing friend of mine, and he's been a friend of Bowie State. So I'm so pleased to have the honor to introduce him and by the way, I only gave you a short, brief biography. If you go to Google search, you'll see something far more extensive on the extensive work that John has done. Again, it's my pleasure to introduce John Winnington Franklin. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. I'm pleased to be with you this evening and share my family's story uh, in Indian Territory, which eventually becomes Oklahoma. My name is John Whittington Franklin. My grandfather, great grandfather, and father are all part of this story. In 1830, the American Indian Removal Act was passed by Congress, freeing up 7 million acres of land for white farmers. The five so-called civilized tribes held African slaves. The civilized tribes were the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Creek, and Seminole. And on this map here, you see their movement, their forced remo movement, removal from their territories the Seminoles in Florida, the Cherokee in Georgia, the Chickasaw in Tennessee, the Choctaw in Mississippi, and the Creek in Alabama are all forced to walk from the 1830s to Indian Territory, which is what it's called. It's not yet known as Oklahoma. My great-grandfather, David Burney, was enslaved to a Chickasaw family. He was born in 1820 in Tennessee. And as a teenager, he walks with his owners on that purple path that you see in the center of the map from Tennessee to Southern Indian Territory. He becomes a farmer, a rancher, a black cowboy, and frees himself and enlists in the Union Army as David Franklin. We'd always want to know why he chose the name Franklin, but we've been Franklin since the 1860s. He married Millie Franklin, Franklin, and they had 10 children. In his autobiography, which my father and I published in the late 1990s, he says in his first paragraph, I was born on the 6th day of May, 1879, near Homer, a small country village in what was then Pickens County, Chickasaw Nation, Indian Territory. I was the seventh of 10 children born to David and Millie Franklin. 
Dan was, dad was born in Tennessee, not far from Gallatin, and mother was born in Mississippi, not far from Biloxi. I was christened Buck in honor of my grandfather, Buck. At the time of the Civil War, his father ran away from his owner and joined the Union Army as David Franklin. My father and I had this map created to show where my grandfather grew up. If you look in the left hand corner, you'll see uh, the best known town in that area is Paul's Valley. It's both on the river and on the railroad track, which was very important at that time. This is before highways and interstates. He's born in Homer. He grew up on his family farm, learning to ride, rope, and sell cattle with his father in Texas, Kansas, the Oklahoma Pandle Handle, and Arkansas. In 1894, he goes to Berwyn, which you see in the left, left inset on the railroad tracks in that right-hand corner, to attend Dawes Academy and rides his horse home on weekends. In this photo, we see him as about 19 or 20 with his brother Matthew on the left. In 1896, he goes to Nashville to attend Roger Williams University, a Black Baptist college where he meets Molly Lee Parker, his future wife. They study with their mentor, John Hope, for whom they will name their second son. Here he is in 1899 and in 1901. Did you like look like that as a freshman and junior in college? We see him here photographed in the Carver's studio in 1899 and 1901. While my grandparents are in college, petroleum and natural gas are discovered in Indian territory and Tulsa becomes the oil capital of the world. It attracts the Rockefellers, J. Paul Getty, where they make their fortunes before following petroleum to Texas, California, and Saudi Arabia. Much of the petroleum and natural gas is in the eastern part of the territory belonging to Native Americans and African Americans. You see in this map, which is just a section of Indian territory, all the red areas are areas allotted to Creek Indians, and the blue color you see Tulsa in the north and Muskogee on the right. All of that is land controlled by African-Americans, people who had been enslaved by the Creeks in this case. My grandparents are married in 1903 and begin their lives as teachers and farmers in Springer and Ardmore. Fascinated by the law, Grandpop apprentices with black lawyers in Ardmore and takes correspondence courses in the law with the Sprague School of law in Detroit from 1904 to 1907. He then takes the oral exam. Here he is, second from left seated at uh, Atlanta Baptist College, which we now know as Morehouse. So these are the lawyers with whom he apprentices in Ardmore. He takes the oral exam of the bar and scores the second highest and is admitted to the Oklahoma bar in December 1907, one month after statehood. The first law passed by the state legislature is to assure that transportation is segregated. Here's Grandpa with his other lawyers outside the firm in, in Ardmore in 1910. That's, his, that's Grandpa's horse and buggy on the left. And inside, that's my grandfather seated on the left. He's 30 years old. And you see a picture of President Taft on the wall on the left. There he is with other attorneys and their secretary. By 1915, Woodrow Wilson is president and imposes strict segregation on Washington, D.C. and federal offices, dismissing many black federal employees. His classmate at Johns Hopkins, Thomas Dixon, has written The Klansman, which D.W. Griffith films as the film Birth of the Nation, demonizing African-Americans, particularly during Reconstruction, and celebrating the Ku Klux Klan. With the end of World War I, Black troops return from Europe, where those with guns have fought under the French flag and won French medals, Le Croix de Guerre. Those under the U.S. flag 
loaded and unloaded ships and dug ditches and graves under Southern white officers. The return of these African-American veterans is met with extreme hostility and many are lynched in their uniforms during the red summer of 1919 when riots break out in three dozen American cities. Representing a client in Shreveport, Louisiana, he's seated in the court with his client when the case is lifted, when the case is called. He stands with his client and the judge asks why he's standing in his courtroom. Grandpa, B.C. Franklin, replies that there, he's there to represent his client, whereupon the judge says, no N is representing anyone in my courtroom. Sit down or get out. In 1912, he moves to one of the all-black towns, Rentisville, recruited by the city fathers. On the first Sunday, the city fathers come to my grandparents' home and said, we did not see you in church this morning, to which my grandfather replies that we attended the Methodist service. You're not a Baptist, but you went to Baptist institutions. The city father said, we don't trust Methodists. So they did not give him any business. Discouraged, he moves to Tulsa, February 20th, 1921. There he sees hotels, restaurants, professional offices, and oil leasing offices, nightclubs, grocery and furniture stores, jewelry stores, and furriers. And Oklahoma writer Rilla Askew's novel, Fire in Beulah, there's a brilliant scene where a white woman goes in search of her missing maid and stumbles into the scene in Greenwood of well-dressed African-American men and women frequenting, frequenting these establishments, driving their cars and taxis beyond her wildest dreams. Grandpa Franklin meets people like O.W. and Emma Gurley, who, who had bought the original 40 acres that formed Greenwood. Gurley built the first two-story building that housed a rooming house and a grocery store. He met John and Lula Williams, who opened the East End Garage and Ice Cream Parlor and the Dreamland Theater. He met caterer Cleora Butler and the Tulsa star editor, A.J. Smitherman. As in many cases, riots begin when a black man is accused of attacking a white woman. In this case, Dick Rowland, a shoeshine man, had to get to the colored restroom on the top floor of one of the downtown buildings. He touched or stepped on the foot of a white female elevator who, operator who screamed. He was then arrested and taken to the city jail. The Tribune newspaper's account suggesting that a lynching was in order. A white mob soon to be deputized, armed and armed, assembled outside of the courthouse and were confronted by armed black veterans. A shot rang out and all hell broke loose. Here's part of my grandfather's eyewitness account of what he saw May 31st to June 1st, 1921. You must, all, you must also remember that um, this is a time when 41 black men had been lynched in Oklahoma. A white man had been lynched the month before. Grandpa had left grandmom and his two youngest children in Rennesville while grandmom finished teaching the rest of the school year. On May 31st, grandpa recalls the following. It was also commencement season, and the streets of the city are filled all day long with happy, innocent, carefree graduates, colored and white, walking proudly with their caps and gowns. The colored graduates are dreaming, building air castles in their waking dreams. They see themselves rising, mounting higher and higher up the ladder of recognition and renown. I was puzzled, of course. I knew that there was trouble, that a race riot or race war, as it afterward proved to be was in the making and that we would soon be in the midst of a great catastrophe if something was not done at once to avert it. About midnight, I rose and went to the north porch of the second floor of my hotel and looking in a northwesterly direction, I saw the top of Standpipe Hill literally lighted up by the blazes that came from the throats of machine guns and I could hear bullets whizzing and cutting the air. They were shooting now in every direction. And the sounds that came from the thousands and thousands of guns was deafening. 
When the eastern sky reddened, announcing the approach of day, I was standing on the upper porch, thinking, 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 and how different was the coming of this day from that of the day before. I reached my office in safety, but I knew that safety would be short-lived. I now knew the mob spirit. I knew too that government and law and order had broken down. I knew that mob law had been substituted in all its fiendishness and barbarity. I knew that the mobists cared nothing about the written law and the constitution. And I also now knew that he had neither the patience nor the intelligence distinguished between the good and the bad the law abiding and the lawless in my race. From my office window, I could see planes circling in midair. They grew in number and hummed and darted and dipped low. I could hear something like hail falling on the top of my office building. Down East Archer, I saw the old Midway Hotel on fire, burning from the top. What, an attack from the air too, I asked myself. Lurid flames roared and belched and licked the forked tongues in the air. Smoke ascended the sky in thick black volumes and amid it all, the planes, now a dozen or more in number, still hummed and darted here and there with the agility of natural birds of the air. Then a filling station further down East Archer caught on fire from the top. I feared now an explosion and decided to try to move to safer quarters. I came out of my office, locked the door and descended to the foot of the steps. The sidewalks were literally covered with burning turpentine balls. I knew all too well where they came from. And I knew all too well why every burning building first caught from the top. I paused and waited for an opportune time to escape. Where or where is our splendid fire department with its half dozen stations, I asked myself. Is the city in conspiracy with the mob? Grandpa was rounded up by the white mob and interned in the convention hall for several days. He was able to send word to my grandmother that he was unharmed. Everything he had prepared to receive his family was gone. Money, clothes, personal effects. The only building left standing was the Booker T. Washington High School, which the Red Cross used as a hospital and distribute food and supplies to the hundreds left homeless. Grandpa, as you see here, sets up office in a tent with I.H. Spears on the left, my grandfather's on the right, and Effie Thompson as their secretary, a classmate of his from Roger Williams, who with her husband had lost their drugstore to the fire. Together they processed insurance claims of the business and homeowners of Greenwood, but none would be honored. The city council passed an ordinance requiring those to rebuild with non-flammable materials, which Grandpa successfully fought to the state Supreme Court. It would take years to build Greenwood, and when our family was reunited in 1925, Greenwood was still under construction. Here you have an image, just one of many. If you Google Tulsa race riot, you'll see photographs like this, bodies in the streets, trees burn, and people living in tents. You see a couple of tents here in the back. This is a photograph of a man photographing the ruins of his home. It's one of the most powerful images I've seen. In the interim, my grandfather has, is in Tulsa. My grandmother and her two youngest children, my father here on the right, and his sister right here on the right, are left in Rendersville. They fortunately did not, were not subjected to the massacre and have that traumatic uh, experience. But um, my grandmother then has to raise them for the next uh, four years. They're reunited here in 1925 and my father, go and his sister go to um, Booker T. Washington High School. So my father seated just to the right of this triangle here, it's right here. Uh, he skipped several grades, he graduates at 16. This is his graduating class. There he is right there in the front. And here he is valedictorian of his class in 1931. 
I found this photograph the other day. It's not very clear, but the sign right here says B.C. Franklin Law Attorney. And you can tell by the clothes the women are wearing and the cars that it's the 1940s. Well, it's very exciting to see, see this sign of my grandfather. Here he is walking down the streets. My father would accompany him often between Greenwood, which is right at the edge of downtown, uh, and accompany my grandfather to the court. Here's my grandfather seated with the hat on the left as part of the North Tulsa Club. I love this image because it shows a range of children and men and women of all ages. This is the only the second picture I have of my grandmother. When she moves with her children to Tulsa, she's able to um, stop teaching for a while. She opens a daycare center so that Black women in Greenwood can leave their children in safety and go to work. Uh, they're working both in black homes, uh, but predominantly for white families as domestics, uh, as cooks. The men are working as chauffeurs, gardeners, uh, and they work in businesses in Greenwood as well. This is the final picture I have of my grandfather's formal portrait. And the only picture I've ever seen of him smiling He's honored in 1959, the year before he dies, um, by the YMCA for all of his contributions to the community. Um, it took years for Greenwood to rebuild. As I said, the insurance companies refused to honor uh, the insurance policies that the homeowners and black businesses had taken out. My grandfather fought that um, ordinance, that city ordinance successfully to the state Supreme Court, and he continued to practice law until he died. At one point in 1938, a lawyer told me at a conference that we held in my father's honor that my grandfather had sued the white paper for defamation of character, they call him, and in the newspaper, in an editorial. And the judge wrote back, he said, that's the way it is. You call a Negro and you call a Chinaman a and uh, so he fearlessly fought the white power establishment in Tulsa, uh, and a park is now named in his honor. It was built in the 19, early 1970s. Uh, he died, as I said, in 1916. My father then left Tulsa in 1931 and goes to Fisk. Interesting. My grandmother and grandfather meet in Nashville at Roger Williams, which is a school that no longer exists. It was mysteriously burned down and replaced by a white college. I'd like to do more about that. And my parents meet and are freshman sweethearts at Fisk, and they graduate in the class of 1935. My mother goes to uh, Hampton to get a second bachelor's in library science, and my father goes to Harvard um, to get his master's in 1936 and his PhD in 1931. I'm currently reading his first book based on his PhD dissertation called The Free Negro in North Carolina. And this is all before the Civil War and it's fascinating. I'm in a section right now where blacks in certain counties are allowed to vote in the 1830s. I just didn't know that was possible. So it's important to continue to read and continue to learn throughout your life. Um, my mother and father marry in 1940, and my father uh, begins his first teaching assignment in Raleigh, North Carolina at St. Augustine's College. My mother is uh, a librarian in the public schools there. And then they moved to Durham in 1943, where my father will teach at North Carolina Central University, North Carolina College for Negroes, as it was called at that time. And my mother was the law librarian. In uh, late 1946, my father completes his best known book, From Slavery to Freedom. He's come up to Washington to use the Library of Congress and the National Archives. And he has been invited that year to move to Howard University here in Washington, DC. And uh, he teaches at Howard from 47 to 56. 
In the fall of 47, the From Slavery to Freedom is published and that thrusts him on the national stage. He's already uh, given many papers uh, at the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History and at the Southern Historical Association. Uh, but now he becomes nationally known. He's at Howard from 47 to 56. My mother is a librarian in Prince George's County and in the DC public school system until we moved to New York in 1956, where it's announced on the front page of the New York Times that my father will become the first black Negro historian to chair a department in a historically white institution. And so we moved to New York and we have a very interesting time there. Um, there are new kinds of segregation in New York that we encounter. My father and mother try to purchase a home and they go and look in the newspapers every Sunday, call the address, uh, call the house that's for sale. And when they arrive each time, people say, oh, if you just come a few minutes earlier, the house was just sold which meant they really didn't want to sell it the way. We finally got a house on New York Avenue. The man came and looked at us through the window, went back and poured himself a drink. And they came and opened the door and sold us the house. But no banks in New York would lend my parents the money to buy the house. So this is the way discrimination continued in other parts of the country than just the South. Um, I grew up in New York, Chicago, uh, my father's at the University of Chicago, and uh, then I leave the nest and go to California to Stanford, and then I moved to Senegal, and I lived in Senegal for eight years. And it's in Senegal, while I was teaching English for the Ministry of Higher Education, that the Smithsonian found me and hired me initially on contract to be their representative in West Africa, and brought me back to the States, to D.C., to present uh, the Black French-speaking countries at the 1976 Folklife Festival. And so that's how I was introduced to the Smithsonian. And uh, I go back and live in Senegal. I come back here for graduate school in 82. And the person who had initially hired me on contract in Senegal ran into me in the Metro one day. And she said, we need you at the Smithsonian now. And that led to my career at the Smithsonian from which I retired in, in 2019 after 32 years. So at this point, I welcome questions from the audience. I've taken you from the 1820s right up to now. The uh, Tulsa celebrated, observed the centennial of the massacre uh, last year. And it's given me the opportunity to read and reread and read again my grandfather's autobiography. And I pull so much knowledge out of it each time I read it. Uh, he was a fascinating man. And he and my grandmother created the context, rich home life that my father grew up in and thrived. Thank you. My name is Triopia Washington, and it is my honor to bring the closing remarks for the College of Education Black History Month program. Black history is American history. On behalf of the College of Education, I offer thanks to our speaker, John W. Franklin. We are so grateful to learn about his family's special journey and their role in the Tulsa massacre. We are also honored by the participation of members of our BSU family, Dr. Sammy Miller, History Department, and our own Dr. Sean Coleman, Associate Dean, College of Education, and the always supported Dean of the College of Education, Dr. Rhonda Jetter. In addition, this event could not have been made possible without the support and cooperation of Ms. Annette Wedderburn and Dr. Otis Thomas. 
I also want to offer a special thank you to Miss Christina Moody, who helped to get the ball rolling. I leave you with quotes that are important for us all to remember. Quote, if you know whence you came, there is really no limit to where you can go. End of quote by James Baldwin. Quote, a people without the knowledge of their past history is like a tree without roots. End of quote. Marcus Garvey. We thank you for your attention as we close with the presentation of Lift Every Voice.